Everyone loves a good transformation, but no transformation captivates the human psyche quite like the downward spiral of one's aspirational archetype. The transformation from the paragon of Western success to a cautionary tale of clinical insanity. I can't wait to join you in heaven. <laughs> but has the true origin of my mental and physical deterioration remained untold by mainstream narratives? Others speculated that his weight loss might have been the result of some kind of addiction. Did my two-year interlude depict the darkest depths of mental instability? or a delusional pinnacle of freedom. I am free! And did the bizarre appearances on social media accurately convey my reality? Or were they facets of some sort of performance? Give this man an Oscar. These are a few of the many questions we'll be answering in this full, never before heard story of me, Connor Murphy. So grab your protein shake, sit back, relax, and enjoy the internet's most remarkable tale before it gets taken down. I want to start off with an apology. Throughout my YouTube career, I have been indirectly and unintentionally promoting ideologies that while on the surface may seem relatively benign or even positive and inspiring, are troublesome when examined at a deeper psychological level. So I want to apologize to my audience for creating this online persona that has perpetuated problematic ideals and actually encouraged insecurities under a motivational facade. You'll need to watch this entire video to understand why this apology is warranted, but I'd like to start off by deconstructing the harmful character that propelled me to YouTube startup. Throughout this video, you should notice a prevailing theme I wish to represent. That is, in many facets of life, whether it be social media, the news, or the personality fronted by an individual, what appears on the surface is not the reality. See, it's a mistake to conflate an internet persona Dragon balls all over your IG crush's fake lips. with the real life personality. I want to tell a story and entertain people. In my case, the distinction between the two is immense. The character you've recognized by the thematic reveal of his physique while interacting with women is a total act. It's a persona I created for my social media endeavors. Not once have I ever behaved comparably off camera. This character was constructed while I was an introverted college nerd, double majoring in computational math and economics. The purpose was to start a social media business to avoid a 9 to 5 job. The content I created was strategically business oriented. After studying successful videos posted by the likes of Ziz and Jeff Side, I recognized the content that would assuredly go viral. Content encapsulating the fictitious fantasy that most young aspiring bodybuilders envision. A physique that generates endless validation from women. But of course, what appears on the surface isn't the reality. I was more of a circus performer than a pickup artist. Take away the performative and comedic elements and what's left are well-deserved negative reactions to a shallow, socially uncalibrated, attention-seeking narcissist. I'll be posting a full video of the never-before-seen negative reactions on my main channel to demonstrate this reality that most aren't aware of. See, there's a reason why at first, despite my audience's fantasies, I didn't sleep with the girls from my videos. The percentage of girls that I sleep with from my videos, it's extremely low. It's like 1% max. 1%. The truth was, after the performance on camera came to an end, I was still just an insecure, socially anxious little kid with nothing else to offer and of course women with their high social intuition saw right through me and they went for other guys. See, a confident dad bod beats a socially anxious Greek god every single time. The demographic you will most impress with a muscular build are other men. And an aesthetic physique is the ultimate dick magnet. And even though I was quite aware that I was portraying the falsehood that an aesthetic physique is the primary factor that leads to success with women, I was so enthused with my social media success that I justified this disingenuousness by acknowledging that my audience found this content motivational. But I was motivating them to acquire their ideal physique for the wrong reason, to get the approval of others. 
And for that, I sincerely apologize because seeking external validation is a fundamental psychological pitfall that can lead to a cascade of detrimental mentalities that are so prevalent in the world of social media. Again, what appears on the surface isn't the reality. The content influencers post on social media doesn't accurately reflect their real life. People are drawn to materialistic achievements such as great physiques, cars, and money. Men fantasize about the potential hedonistic pleasures born from women and fame, but fail to see the evidence indicating that such a lifestyle is unfulfilling. Notice the celebrities with lifestyles you aspire to live, who have been addicted to drugs and even committed self-deletion. Maybe the status quo of success isn't what you're looking for. It should be obvious that the acquisition of superficial accomplishments doesn't inoculate you from the insecurities that compel their pursuit. Yet we imagine others' lives as idyllic. We dismiss the challenges they still face. And when we compare our lives to this illusion, depression is sure to follow. Take a closer look at some of the fitness influencers you've looked up to. Ziz, my inspiration for my social media business, the idol of so many. His online persona, Ziz, was also just an act. It's a fucking act. There is no Ziz. The real person, Aziz Shavershin, never found the true confidence he was seeking. Before his fame and even after his fame, he was very, very insecure. And he was he was in a lot of pain and a lot of hurt because he, deep down, he's, he's still that skinny kid. Callum Von Moger, former Mr. Universe, the archetype of a successful bodybuilder, recently attempted to unalive himself. And Luke Sandow also committed self-deletion. And because of the stigma of mental health, his family said it was just heart failure. Yes, his heart might have failed, but this wasn't an accident. What happened with Luke was uh, was a choice. It was his choice. We'll never comprehend quite what he was struggling with. Um, it makes you wonder how many of these bodybuilding heart failures are intentional, and how many are more to come if something doesn't change. I want to start off by thanking the bodybuilding community for the life lessons it's taught me. I certainly do not perceive myself as a victim of the bodybuilding world, but more so a graduate. Another theme you'll discover I symbolize commonly through satire is the discouragement of the victim mentality that leads to the self-destruction of one's own mental health. But it's certainly important to become aware of the limitations of certain mindsets perpetuated by the bodybuilding world. I also want to make it clear that bodybuilding isn't inherently insidious. Some of you may have a healthy relationship with bodybuilding, but from someone who has been immersed in the community for seven years now, who has read thousands of DMs and comments laced with destructive mindsets and witnessed the unconscious self-sabotage of countless individuals, I can confidently say that bodybuilding is the most widespread, harmful cult that remains relatively covert by masquerading as a self-improvement community. Like most cults, bodybuilding preys on individuals with deep insecurities. Think of the reason why a lot of these people started is because they were like, they had like insecurities when they were young, so they started, you know, wanting yeah. to get bigger. I know that's how I was. It attracts individuals who are depressed, socially anxious, or otherwise unsatisfied with life. Take me, for example. I was bullied as a kid, developed severe social anxiety, and discovered this fantasy that bodybuilding propagated. But if I developed my body to its full potential, I would gain respect from others, which would imbue me with the true confidence I lacked. But instead of healing insecurities at their core, bodybuilding hides them beneath a veneer of superficial, contrived confidence. See, people use bodybuilding as a band-aid. They hide the core issue that is their deep insecurity and lack of self-confidence with a layer of muscle. It doesn't actually fix the core issue that is their fear of the judgment of others and the addiction to their approval. It is extremely evident that muscle mass doesn't dissolve insecurity. In most cases, insecurity simply manifests in dangerous ways, such as body dysmorphia. See, if the root insecurities aren't abolished, no amount of muscle is sufficient. This severe body dysmorphia that causes serious bodybuilders 
to abuse illegal drugs and knowingly shed decades off of their life just to achieve a specific aesthetic is the most dangerous, overlooked mental disorder. That's a lot of what bodybuilding is, you know? Drug abuse as a result of insecurity. Studies have shown bodybuilders' mortality rates are 34% higher than average. The results of these studies vary, but the comparison of some show bodybuilding to be more lethal than smoking over 30 cigarettes per day. You know, if I had the risk of you know dying at 40 years old, I would have said, okay, I'll, I'll take the Olympia title, but that mentality changes as you get older. The willingness to sacrifice half your life for any cause should be considered clinical insanity. Instead, it's a sport, eating disorders. Only the most honest, self-aware individuals will talk about them. But the common symptoms of eating disorders cannot be distinguished from the common bodybuilding dieting protocols. And I was not immune to falling into these traps. In 2015, I did my first bulk. I was eating around 4,200 calories per day, stuffing my face every day until I nearly vomited, consuming extremely unnecessary amounts of protein, cutting out fiber to avoid appetite suppression. This destroyed my gut microbiome and consequently my skin microbiome. This caused a severe flare-up of MRSA, an antibiotic resistant bacteria that caused up to 20 large painful abscesses all over my lower body. And antibiotics only worsened this issue in the long run. They provided temporary relief at the cost of the further deterioration of my gut health. And this disease is deadly, and it could have literally killed me if I didn't set my ego aside and sacrifice my muscle for a healthier diet. Then in June 2016, I did my first bodybuilding show, a standard endeavor of fitness influencers. As a standard bodybuilding protocol, I restricted my calories to near starvation levels destroyed my hormones and lost significant muscle, which is a common result for natural competitors. I looked tiny on stage and my metabolism was never the same. From then on, it was much more challenging to stay lean. And because my success of my new business was largely contingent on my physique, I spent the next few years making the mistake of obsessively restricting calories just to maintain visible abs, which kept my hormones out of balance, negatively impacted my cognitive function, and ironically, my physical appearance. What I once saw as admirable bodybuilding feats, I now view as destructive rituals. But what's more disheartening is that I consider myself one of the lucky ones. I was fortunate enough to watch my fitness career implode. See, my business revolved around three main income sources, YouTube ad revenue, brand deals, and fitness e-products. But never did I imagine all three could diminish so rapidly. Of course, it began in the comment section, where the narrative spread that my physique was deteriorating. Now, it didn't affect women's reactions to my physique, but it certainly affected the reaction of my 95% male audience. The enthrallment with my perceived negative transformation was disappointingly illuminating. It was an insight I would never forget. And I'll concede my physique may have not appeared as sharp. And because of the increased engagement that the negativity triggered, I went with it. We decided that it would be a perfect time to go on a journey in search of my abs. But my perceived loss of gains was certainly dramatized by misleading photo selection. Again, what appears on the surface is not the reality. Different photo selections from similar periods of time tell a completely different story. See, a physique can look dramatically different in just five to 10 minutes by altering many factors, including lighting, angles, and pump. Regardless, it was alleged that the decline in my aesthetic was due to the cessation of my anabolic androgenic steroid usage in fear that these drugs were contributing to my hair loss. But then he can't go back on cycle to get it back because he knows if he goes back on cycle, he's just gonna rape his hair even worse. It suggested I was a fake natty, that I had lied about my performance enhancing drug use. Consequently, my workout and diet programs stopped selling, since steroids were seen as the primary facilitator of my physique, rather than my diet and exercise routines. I was deemed a fraud, and my views, ad revenue, and brand deal opportunities began to diminish. And maybe I completely deserved it. Maybe I was a fake natty, but more on that later in this video. Each month, I watched my revenue dwindle. Paying $3,500 for rent in LA didn't leave me much time. 
I found myself recurrently wishing I'd gotten that 9-to-5 job. I began searching for other potential career paths. I considered acting in the hopes that I had developed the potential through years of playing a character on camera. My friend introduced me to agent and director, Archie Archambo, and he began finding me auditions. After months of practicing and dozens of auditions, I finally secured my first paid role in a Bachelorette satire series, the surfer who caused the Bachelorette to have this mental breakdown. She would have murdered me. Oh yes, I do mean that literally. Archie was like an uncle. He intentionally kept his client base small so he could be more involved. He helped us create social media content that he could pitch to producers interested in creating series or movies. You know that's not true, right? It's an old wives tale made up by a couple of dick lickers. <laughs> I told you. Oh, that's sick. We just needed the attention of one producer. Unfortunately, Archie is no longer with us. But before that, we had grandiose plans. And there's nothing that compels more grandiosity than an ayahuasca experience. Ayahuasca is traditionally used as a ceremonial spiritual medicine among the indigenous peoples of South America. It's generally consumed as a brew, prepared with various plants that allow for the oral activation of DMT, one of the most powerful psychedelic substances on Earth. It has no physical tolerance and is non-addictive. In fact, studies have shown it to successfully treat addictions. Studies have also shown it to be extremely well physiologically tolerated and have consistently demonstrated a myriad of beneficial mental health effects including increased cognition and decreased anxiety and depression. The more common experiences include a greater sense of compassion, connectedness, and well-being. The more dramatic possible experiences include complete ego dissolution and profound mystical experiences. And what it's connected to uh, in South American religious and spiritual thinking uh, is what happens to us when we die. I was an atheist and I opened my eyes at one point in the circle and I was like, oh, I'm in the presence of God right now. And its ability to untangle knots of mental trauma leads some to equate a cup of ayahuasca to 10 years of therapy. Ayahuasca is 10 years of psychotherapy in one night. Yes, my brother. But fundamentally, ayahuasca alters your neurochemistry, leading to novel thoughts and experiences in which you were previously unacquainted with. This has the potential to increase your creativity and alter your perspectives. Despite its benefits, aversion to ayahuasca is prevalent due to its label as a drug. Which is fair. By definition, a drug can be defined as any substance that has a physiological effect when ingested or otherwise introduced into the body. But no ingested substance fails to affect the body's physiology, not even food. See, the linguistic usage of drugs is purely connotational and this subjectivity breeds hypocrisy. For example, alcohol is arguably the most widespread, damaging substance, both individualistically and collectively. There's no single substance that has led to a higher volume of heart disease, cancer, diabetes, and neurodegenerative diseases, except for maybe processed sugar. Nor a single substance that causes more social harm. 40% of violent crimes involve alcohol use, 30% of traffic crash fatalities involve drunk drivers. Yet, alcohol consumption is normalized. Drinkers don't consider themselves drug users. Yet, the decriminalization and acknowledgement of the psychotherapeutic potential of psychedelic drugs has just begun and is met with opposition despite overwhelming evidence of their positive effects. This should make you question the judgment and the motives behind the socio-political structures that decide which drugs are legal and normalized. Now, due to some legal protection for its religious and ceremonial applications, the legality of ayahuasca use is complicated, but its ingredients can be purchased legally and quite inexpensively. But I wouldn't recommend consuming it flippantly. Ayahuasca isn't traditionally used for recreation, but for spiritual and personal development reasons. Because the potential for uncomfortable experiences is boundless. Just as sculpting your ideal physique requires physical discomfort, purifying your mind requires mental discomfort. 
and an ayahuasca experience, it's, it's like lifting weights for the mind. But I was prepared for the most grueling workout. It was necessary. See, my life had reached an inflection point. I needed direction. I sought insight into my situational predicament. Should I continue to pursue acting? Or could I practically rebrand myself and continue my social media career? Or should I find another profession? So with a referral from a friend, I partook in an ayahuasca ceremony in Joshua Tree, California, May 1st and 2nd, 2020. I have no commentary on the experience. Although futile, perhaps I'll attempt to articulate its profundity at another time. I'll only expound on the aftermath. I was overwhelmed with inadvertent perspective shifts, both worldly and metaphysically. I was bombarded with an overflow of insights into my life direction. I was flooded with pursuits I wished to accomplish, and I was instilled with an unfathomable motivation to achieve them all. Doctors would later describe this mentality as delusions of grandeur from drug-induced psychosis. See, I wanted to become the greatest actor that ever lived. I wanted to open people's minds to more valuable perspectives. But more than anything, I wanted to save the community that privileged me with a platform to make a difference. I want to be clear that this was not an act, but it was certainly a more dramatic transformation than any actor has ever made to embody a character. See, in the cult of bodybuilding, there is nothing more blasphemous than 40 straight days of muscle-wasting catabolism. Over 40 days, I lost 42.4 pounds. So, as the symbolic antithesis of bodybuilding ideologies, I dubbed this character the bodybuilding antichrist, and I thank Jesus for the inspiration for my 40-day fast. Some claim 40-day fast can heal any illness, mental or physical. Others would argue it's unhealthy, and maybe it was. I see the perspective of medical professionals. They view this as a psychosis-induced eating disorder, or even an attempt to unalive myself. I received many calls from mental health experts during the fast, discouraging its continuation. One of the things I had on note here was that you were doing like a 40-day fast? Yes, that's true. YouTube even age-restricted my live streams because they considered it so dangerous. But I survived, unlike many bodybuilders who have passed from preparation for a show. Because instead of intentionally dehydrating myself, I drank plenty of water. But that was it. Only water, not a single calorie for 40 straight days. And for those whose minds are closed to this possibility, despite my 42 pound weight reduction, I actually live streamed the entire journey. 24 hours per day, deprived not only of food, but privacy. As you can imagine, not eating wasn't the only temptation I faced. 40 days locked in a room with no food nor fap was the ultimate implementation of SIAR. Stimulation Induced Apathy Reversal, a powerful technique in my social anxiety course that defeats the addictions that are replacing your social life. Probably the number one has been reduced social anxiety. And that is the one other benefit that I've really noticed. More on that soon. But the physical trials paled in comparison to the mental fortitude required for success. The psychological strength to witness 13 years of hard-earned muscle, the muscle I identified with, the muscle that gave me a career, the muscle I had earned in the aspiration of self-confidence, gone. A bodybuilder's worst nightmare. And it was beautiful because for once, I was finally big enough. No longer was I attached to what others thought of my physique. Any remaining fragments of body dysmorphia were abolished. This was the beginning of a dramatic mental transformation. A transformation ridding myself of the addiction to the approval of others. A transformation conquering the fear of others' judgment. I was about to disregard many social norms. Was this a symptom of psychopathic tendencies or the beneficial destruction of my social anxiety? Well, that's for you to know and for me to find out.
February 2016, Southwestern University, Georgetown, Texas. I was squatting in my dorm room, praying my next online encounter would be a girl rather than an exposed penis. The chances were low, but I was optimistic, and the dicks were worth the potential views. This series was the one that jump-started my social media career. I was screen recording the website Omegle, a video chat site that allows you to interact with random strangers. And of course, I was about to unzip my jacket in hopes of an animated female reaction. My webcam was placed on exactly the 26 window blind to display my physique at the optimal angle. A desk lamp was duct taped to the ceiling, positioned at approximately a 20 degree angle for ideal downlighting. A bottle of olive oil was close by in case I needed to apply more, and my chest was fatigued from the periodic push-ups that kept my chest pumped. But despite my strategic preparation, I was nervous as if the girls might slap me through the screen. The thought of the absurdity of this imminent virtual interaction made me cringe. But I felt like James Bond compared to how awkward I felt during my real life performances. But I certainly wasn't the only one that found my videos cringeworthy. I've heard of you! And then on one hand you're like... See, at first I believe cringe was somehow intrinsically intertwined into the interaction, as if cringe has some sort of inherent objective tangibility. Then one day I sat down to watch my friend and fellow YouTuber Cassidy Campbell's new YouTube video. Uh, 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 sorry, um. I cringed so hard I had to intermittently pause the video. This actually frustrated me. And for the first time, I contemplated where these feelings of cringe actually came from. As it dawned on me, I felt my ego internally throw a tantrum. Yes, I know, cringe is simply vicarious embarrassment. It's the fear of social judgment manifests through secondhand experience. It's a symptom of social anxiety. But this realization was empowering because I now saw cringe as an indicator of my own insecurity. So instead of erroneously believing that cringe was unavoidable, I now had control. What if all cringe comes from a lack of confidence, from social anxiety? I used to cringe at things until I stopped being a whiny little bitch. This is the essence of anti-victim mentality. Taking responsibility for your own thoughts and feelings gives you power and freedom. See, you can't control the behavior of others, but you can control your own reactivity. No one has the power to dictate your emotions such as cringe unless you give them the power. After this epiphany, I decided to train my mind by reflecting on my own social phobias while watching more cringy Cassidy Campbell videos, which desensitized my mind to awkward social situations and expanded my comfort zone. I called this technique Virtual Exposure Mindfulness, VEM, which is extensively covered in my social anxiety course that just launched this week. Link is in the description below. You can see the dramatized demonstration in the video I recently posted on my main channel. But it's not as easy as you think to find content you perceive as cringy, especially as you get more confident. Fortunately for you, I created the ultimate cringe library for you to practice my VEM technique after you get my course. It consists of the videos depicting the peak of my craziest behavior that are no longer public on my YouTube channels. This intense array of cringe is powerful enough to trigger the root social phobias of anyone. The link to the cringe library is in the description below. For the best example of a cringe-prone, socially anxious group is the bodybuilding community. Again, most guys, if they're self-aware enough, will realize their bodybuilding journey was prompted by social insecurity. Now, most aesthetic bras will be caught in self-deception, saying they're bodybuilding for themselves, not for others. But this is usually just a coping mechanism implemented after the recognition from females falls short of their expectations and the recognition from guys exceeds their expectations. Once you start taking like heavy amounts of steroids and really like pushing the envelope, you're really just impressing dudes anyways. Yeah, you are. Just look at the data. There's a reason behind the virality of my videos. Validation from women is the ultimate bodybuilding motivation. But your physical transformation is futile without an analogous mental one. Your mind's transformative potential is even higher in magnitude than your body's. Yet no one is training their mind to become free from insecurity. I think that that's worse than skipping leg day. So I design an exercise that you may enjoy 
if you can muster up the courage to try it. I thought I'd bring out my inner guru and spread the love with Prima Sati Yoga. Based off Osho's tantric yoga practices, it's a social anxiety technique that requires facing your fears of eye contact and intimacy. It involves many awkward poses that really gets you and her or him out of your social comfort zone in a motivating way. But it's good to get out of our comfort zone, right? It's gonna help our social anxiety. It's also a meditative practice that involves mindful breathing, which has been shown to reduce anxiety. <sighs> This is some full-ass cultish behavior. I also decided to face my smaller insecurities and put the unfamily-friendly version of Prima Sati Yoga on OnlyFans. Watch us take this exercise to the next level on OnlyFans. <laughs> I bet it's like one second of this on the OnlyFans and it just goes to Yeah. I realized the only hindrance from me making money, doing what I love most, was the fear of others' judgment my own social anxiety. But Prima Sati Yoga isn't an easy challenge without an initial reduction in social anxiety. That's where my ACE method comes in. It's called um, anti-conditioned expressiveness. See, I used to try and act all cool around women, trying to be that cool, calm, collected, Brad Pitt motherfucker. Then I realized that wasn't true confidence. It was reaping of insecurity. I was putting up a false front to get the approval of others. I was acting, and girls with their high social intuition sniffed right through that. Ironically, over-filtering yourself does the opposite of its intent. It's fucking creepy. Just like wearing a mask, girls are creeped out when they feel like you're hiding something. So how did I fix cool guy syndrome? How did I learn not to fear the judgment of others? How did I break my addiction to their approval? How did I remove my filter? How did I really overcome my social anxiety? He seems to have dropped all insecurities. He made a video admitting he uses a penis extender for God's sake. Doesn't it seem kind of nice being exactly who you really are at all times without having fear of how people think of you or how they talk about you? Seems kind of nice to me. Anti-conditioned expressiveness. This is my favorite and most powerful technique in my social anxiety course that just launched. You can see the expert level demonstration of this technique in the video I just posted on my other channel. The idea is to intentionally, in a controlled environment, film yourself acting outside of societal norms. For beginners, you can start out just by acting eccentric on camera, just getting out of your emotional comfort zone and expressing those emotions you've been repressing due to societal conditioning is beneficial in and of itself. Psychologists will all agree that repressing emotions can lead to depression and anxiety. Many of my students have been practicing this technique with epic results. Hell yeah, bro. You feel free, bro? Dude, I honestly do feel better. Dude, you feel way better, right? I do, I feel like a new man. Expression is the opposite of depression. Intermediate difficulty would be to send the video to a friend to overcome the fear of their judgment. Of course, you can explain yourself afterward and actually challenge them to do the exercise as well. You can also watch the video back yourself and practice my virtual exposure mindfulness technique to overcome those feelings of cringe you will inevitably feel. Your own cringe compilation is the best virtual exposure mindfulness material. Now posting it on social media without any explanation, that's expert mode. See, with each social abnormality I posted, a layer of social anxiety was peeled back the fear of the judgment of others was dissolved, and I felt so much more free. Of course, there are varying levels to the intensity of this. Beginner level would be to just act moderately goofy and cringy. Expert level would probably involve behavior societally considered disgusting. But don't worry, you don't actually have to do it. The point is to make people believe that you did it. The more believable, the tougher the challenge. You can make the props fake until you're brave enough to try the real thing. <laughs> I reveal the recipes in my video I posted on my other channel. But not caring about what people think is a firm requirement here. And in my course, I teach you the various mindsets and thought exercises that prepare you for the more behavioral exercises. My course is only available this week to reward those who have been closely following my storyline and have found deeper meaning in my esoteric content. I evolved, and you can too.
I set out on a quest to defeat the demons of insecurity that torment the bodybuilding psyche. But first, I needed to set a precedent, so I temporarily deleted my old superficial videos to promote the search for internal confidence. You will never find happiness chasing these external material desires. I even took down my legendary bodybuilding program, which is currently only available as a bonus to my social anxiety course. For the pursuit of superficial confidence has proven to be detrimental without the accompaniment of quality inner confidence mentalities. I flew to San Francisco, the home of natural bodybuilder Chris Elkins, to present Primasati workouts, which include awkward social anxiety exercises that train your mind as you train your body, developing inner confidence as you grow your outer confidence. I drove to Dallas, Texas to train with Chris Jones, a spiritually passionate influencer, to demonstrate the meditation and breathing exercises that alter your neurochemistry, creating a brain less prone to social fears, and to promote letting go of the egoic facets of the mind. Connor and myself had to lose our minds in order to find ourselves. I also reversed my biological age by two years in only six months. At age 25, my biological age was 26. Now, at age 26, my epigenetic age had decreased to 24. As this was done naturally without doctor intervention, this was unprecedented. A testament to the health contrast between my varying lifestyles. Now, the bodybuilding world worships physical appearance, including hair. His hairline is getting a lot worse. It's getting thin at the front. Causing him to lose hair. Receding, receding, receding. So again, I committed blasphemy. Do you think it's gonna hurt? Uh, yes. <laughs> I undertook the first ever hair transplant without local anesthetic to display the power of the mind and to represent the pain that inevitably follows the attachment to superficial pursuits. Then four months later, as the results began to show, I shave them away to exhibit the true confidence that's independent of one's hairline. Then I returned to Omegle to continue my acclaimed series, but this time I played a new character that satirized the damaging hidden mentalities that the old character promoted. Hey guys, so I'm extremely materialistic and I believe that the better that my physique gets, the more happy that I'll be. I don't realize that it's a never ending rat race and that the real issue is not the lack of my physique, but it's a deep rooted insecurity from my societal conditioning that makes me believe that I'm not good enough. So I'm gonna take off my shirt, please give me some validation, please. But not before I traveled to Las Vegas, Nevada to visit Kenny K.O., one of the few fitness influencers that was a proponent of the controversial opinion that my physique was obtained naturally. Uh, I would say Connor Murphy, he claims natural, he's only 22.4. I would say he is natural, he gets my approval. I had something to admit. Kenny, I have something I have to confess to you. I might not be natural, and I need your opinion. In 2019, I did two two-month cycles of MK677. You took a song. It's not a sign. <laughs> Alright, growth hormone secretagogue. Oh, Correct. Yeah. Correction. And back in 2017, for two weeks I took Osterine. Okay, another sign. That's a sign. Right, it's not sorry. another sign. Yeah. Correct. And although these aren't the anabolic androgenic steroids I was accused of taking, they weren't trivial. And maybe I should have let my fans know. But after meticulous contemplation, I realized they weren't the only unnatural substances I had consumed. I had taken natural testosterone boosters like ashwagandha, but these concentrated extracts allowed for these herbs to be consumed at dosages unavailable to primal humans without technology. If you're taking creatine at doses that you can't get from just eating a normal amounts of food, are you actually natural? I'm gonna say no. So was this really natural? I began to see how this false dichotomy of natural versus unnatural ignored relativity. Caffeine used to be a banned substance, but is now considered natural. It occurred to me that naturalness is a fabricated human concept, more accurately depicted as a spectrum. Connor Murphy points out there is no natural or not natural. Technically, it's all on a spectrum, and he's kind of right. So I proposed a more nuanced way of thinking, the natty or not spectrum, and I put myself around a three or a four. 
and I hope others will adopt this mentality to utilize performance enhancing substances with a more balanced approach. Instead of a black or white all or nothing mentality that has the potential for drug abuse. But words are only so powerful, and inciting real change usually requires a compelling story. So as a personal social anxiety challenge, and as an endeavor to emancipate the bodybuilding world from their most repressed insecurity, I set out on a journey involving a substance that exemplifies the false dichotomy of natural versus not. A pre-technology natural substance that contains over a dozen steroidal hormones, this substance's paradoxical nature has some people calling it divine. Shit. You owe me, bro. May 29th, 2017. I released this video. I blindfolded girls, and they determined whether or not I was dateable based on only touching my body. I was repeatedly fondled by girls, and I even filmed me taking one home. But of course, it was an act. What appeared on the surface was not the reality. I didn't take any girls home. See, underneath the character I played was just a socially anxious nerd. In fact, this video idea was one of my favorites because the talking involved was minimal. And after the camera turned off, I couldn't hold a conversation with a girl for more than 30 seconds. But I was comfortable enough around guys to make one little joke that provoked a surprising insight into the bodybuilding community that I would never forget. How many girls do you get? Yeah, I'm more than you, that's for sure. I had to ask, but I don't. You probably do, because I'm, I'm gay and I'm a virgin. I thought nothing of it. I included it to add a little humor. And no one batted an eye at the virgin element of that joke. But everyone was obsessed that I said I was gay. Dozens of comments poured in. The pervasive curiosity of my sexuality was quite eye-opening. And the more immersed in the bodybuilding community I became, the more it made sense. The historical start of bodybuilding was a lot funded by, funded and promoted by gay men. See, there's no other community that spends more time meticulously analyzing the physiques of half-naked dudes, obsessed with the substances they may or may not be injecting into their ass. The more research I did, the more confident I was with my hypothesis. You know, basically be like, uh, I don't know what you would call it, like an escort or something. I don't know why people don't really talk about it, the bodybuilders talk about because we all dealt with it at the time. Like, hey, you want to do that? You get your people were doing it for the pro card. Bodybuilding isn't just a cult. It's a gay sex cult. Yet almost everyone is in the closet. Bodybuilding requires a necessary obsession for the male physique. And this obsession seems to be counterbalanced with homophobia. At the time, I had never heard of a gay bodybuilder, yet it's obvious bodybuilding is a magnet for gay men. It's no wonder mental instability such as body dysmorphia and eating disorders run rampant in a community that is so firmly suppressing their own sexuality. And in my quest as the savior of bodybuilders, I knew I must liberate them. And there's nothing more compelling than to lead by example. <laughs> so I came out as gay. Yes. But it wasn't easy. But I do want to be serious about one thing because it's been like, it's just been like eating at me. You know what I mean? <sighs> I'm gay. And it was convincing. Was this just an act? Or had the bodybuilding lifestyle developed my inner homo curiosity? That's for you to know and for me to find out. I attempted to glamorize ingesting the divine protein shake, citing all the potential health benefits. So essentially they gave spermidine orally to older patients with dementia and it improved uh, oh their mental functioning. And I was met with extreme opposition. But I demonstrated that you don't need the approval of others. You don't have to fear their judgment. You can free yourself from social anxiety. I anticipated the dislikes. I was equipped for the negative comments with the mental armor of true confidence. 
I recognize the judgment of others simply stems from their own insecurities. One of the main reasons why people probably don't do this is from this deep-rooted homophobia that they're not actually aware of, right? So I met my friend Nico at Ohika Castle in Huntington, New York, a dwelling fit for a lord. And together we announced that I would be drinking his divine protein shake. Nikolai is going to give me his di <laughs> his divine protein shake. Yes. Was I confident enough to finally get out of my comfort zone and actually do it? Well, I'll leave that up for speculation. But it wasn't just strangers that tested my mental toughness. My parents abandoned me because I came out as gay and I had to find a new family. Because my family never accepted me. This is the first time I'm feeling accepted for who I am. For who I am. We are so glad to have you here. Thank you so much. So they officially signed the adoption papers and everything. So they are officially my new family. <laughs> It's so, so heartwarming. And despite my world record golfing score, the PGA Tour banned me for being gay. But I was determined to show my fellow bodybuilders that it doesn't matter who judges you, your self-worth is independent of how others perceive you. So as an inspiring social justice stunt, I streaked at the United States Open, one of the world's most renowned golf tournaments for gay pride during Gay Pride Month in the hopes to inspire bodybuilders to stop putting up that fake front, remove the personality filter that society has conditioned you to retain, and find true inner confidence by being yourself. For those following closely, I actually alluded to this stunt multiple times beforehand. You see, Tiger and I have a lot in common. That's why I'm pulling a giant stunt at the US Open this year. I titled this homoerotic journey, Golf in the Kingdom, IRL after a spiritual golf book by Michael Murphy, which is also my father's name. Golf in the Kingdom is a book written by Michael Murphy. My dad's name is Michael Murphy, so I'm doing this giant golf play in order to end homophobia. And by the way, there are many benefits to being gay. Gay privilege is real. See, no one wants to be labeled as a homophobe. Gays are less likely to be impacted by leftist cancel culture. Say you're gay, just say you're gay. You get away with anything. I was actually the first sporting event streaker to not go to jail. And after I came out, the progressive YouTube moderators actually kept even my most controversial videos monetized. But you want to know the real secret to spread controversial opinions in a society where free speech is under attack. We, me and Arya, are acting. That just set the frame that I could say fucking anything. You gotta frame yourself as a character, putting on a satirical acting performance. This whole thing has been an act. It's on a script. I literally wrote a script for all this. All of this has been an act. At this point in my YouTube escapades, a substantial portion of my audience began to question the mainstream narrative of Connor Murphy's insanity. It was evident that my family didn't abandon me for being gay. Two weeks after my gay pride stunt, my parents and I welcomed two new people into the family. My girlfriend, who my parents adopted, if you check my last music video, we adopted Lauren. And our baby that was on the way. <laughs> and this is the baby. <laughs> See, we wanted to structure our family as God intended. Adam and Eve style. <laughs> Plus, the more family friendly, the more ad revenue, right? Isn't, isn't that how that works? Okay, that's besides the point. The point is, my audience began to notice obviously theatrical elements laced within my videos. There were moments I appeared to break character. <laughs> that was good. Crazy videos were followed by videos depicting relatively normal behavior. What? what? Do you trust me? Yeah. Yes. I'm gonna show you my cringiest TikToks and you're gonna tell me what you think, okay? And even throughout the same video, I would act crazy, but then normal again. 
I'm Stewie Griffin, and I want to take over the world. So I have this really important message to spread about mental health awareness. He basically is very good at turning on his normalness. They noticed I mentioned McJuggernuggets. There's this YouTube channel called McJuggernuggets, who rose to fame for his Psycho Dad series that was intended to look authentic, but was later revealed to be a dramatic performance. I think the beauty of the Psycho series was that it was portrayed as real. If people thought this kid was really going through all these struggles, so to tell that story and you think it's real, you feel a very real connection to the character. These signs combined with the numerous instances of acting claims led my viewers to conspire that everything was an act and that those close to me were in on it. They guessed it was either a dramatic story arc with movie script potential, or a play to promote mental health to the bodybuilding world. Or both. But was I really intentionally leaving behind clues so that those following closely would discover it was all a performance? And was the most intricate clue deliberately basing part of my character on the character from the Broadway musical and now movie, Dear Evan Hansen? Well, that's for you to know, and for me to find out. But here are the similarities supporting this fan theory. Hi, I'm Mike Feist, and I play Connor Murphy in Dear Evan Hansen. Both Connor Murphy characters appeared to be bisexual. Both Connor Murphys appear to suffer from bipolar disorder. You know, the first thing that people are told when they're diagnosed with bipolar disorder is that they're going to be on medication for the rest of their lives. Both Connor Murphy characters were also addicted to drugs. Meaning that he is on one of the, if not the single most powerful, intense psychedelic drug every single day, consuming it every two hours. Both appear to unalive themselves. Connor, they took his own life. And at the end of the video, he basically says, yeah, this is acting, he's doing, and he's like, look, Come see me in 30 minutes, I will be gone. And honestly, I don't know if he's alive right now or not. I do not know. Which was blamed on their dysfunctional families. He was saying goodbye. He's talking about mental health, the struggles that he had with his parents and not feeling accepted. Each prompted a $50,000 fundraiser, although with varying degrees of success. And of course, both Connors partook in musical renditions. Dear Evan Hansen, we've been way too out of touch. It's been an act, the execution has been clutch. Hashtag mental health awareness, hashtag please donate now. And the creator of each Connor Murphy character went by a similar name. I'm Steven Levinson and I wrote the book for Dear Evan Hansen. I wish to remain anonymous, but you can call me Sevenson. Dear Evan Hansen. Was this just coincidence or a purposeful artistic implementation? See, this theory polarized my audience into two groups. The crazy people who thought I was just acting and they claimed to be in on it, and the not crazy people who believed it was real and that I was clinically insane. But just like being natty or not, acting versus reality is another false dichotomy. It's all acting, right? So I mean, I'm acting right now, right? See, that, that's, all right, so that's, that's huge because- See, due to social anxiety, everyone is an actor. You act differently around your close friends than you do a stranger. The fake front you put up is dependent on your social situation. You put on this different act, depending on your situation. You're a chameleon of sorts. Your most genuine thoughts never pass through your verbal filter because you fear the judgment of others. See, the world is a grand play of societal conditioning, and insecurity keeps you stuck in the act. So the real question is, where did I fall on the spectrum of acting, and what was I really trying to accomplish? December 2017, New York City. I was invited to speak at Brandon Carter's business event about my thriving social media business. They want to believe that what they're doing is the right way to do it. And so if you're doing it differently, they're not gonna like that. But I certainly wasn't the most memorable act of the night. That designation goes to Frank Yang, one of the few fitness influencers to transcend the bodybuilding cult seemingly unscathed. This was a seminar filled with serious, business-oriented entrepreneurs who paid good money to attend. 
And there is nothing I'm more grateful for than the opportunity I had to witness Frank Yang utterly mindfuck the entire room. I had been following Frank online, but this was the first time we met in person, and this meeting solidified Frank as one of my top role models. Just months prior, I stepped on the path of self-actualization. After watching Frank's videos, I realized it was possible to transform the mind to optimize your life experience. I understood the physiological benefits of meditation and the scientific evidence pointing to its ability to rewire the brain and reduce social anxiety. But Frank opened my mind to even deeper possibilities. Everything is just inside your mind, so like, right. even if you're an introvert like you, when you're doing all that shit, you're, you're interacting with your own mind, so there's nothing to be afraid of. And I saw Frank as the ultimate authority because he seemed like the freest man on the planet. He embodied the complete lack of social anxiety that I hoped to one day obtain. I spent the next two years gradually immersing myself in the Eastern philosophy that was Frank's passion searching for the wisdom to transform my mind. And there was one thing that really stood out. Anatta, or no-self. There appeared to exist a mysterious Buddhist insight, relatively unfamiliar to the Western world. The possibility to tap into a fundamentally different mental operating system and directly perceive the world from a profoundly different vantage point, or more accurately, a lack thereof. The potential for various mental fitness routines to train the mind to experience reality without experiencing the phenomenon of an internal self that appears to be separate from the external world. And while I couldn't conceptually understand how this could be achievable, it seems like the ultimate social anxiety hack. I mean, fundamentally, social anxiety can only exist by perceiving a distinction between yourself and other people, which seems obvious and unavoidable. But spiritual Eastern traditions would beg to differ. They would say this distinction is fabricated by the human psyche and isn't absolute. Now, of course, I was still skeptical, but then I came across Leo Gura from Actualize.org who articulated this same potential phenomenon, but referred to it as ego death. Through a very rigorous training process, they literally numbed down their ego so much that they dissolved it, and they no longer have that boundary between themselves and the rest of the world. Ego not narrowly referring to the sense of self-esteem, but more broadly to your entire sense of self-identity. Leo advocates the use of dimethyltryptamine. A simple compound found throughout nature which has profound effects on human consciousness. The same psychedelic substance found in ayahuasca to induce such experiences. DMT, the most powerful psychedelic in the world, the magic pill to enlightenment. And he has an entire forum dedicated to this pursuit. If you want to be enlightened, check out Actualize.org. But are the Buddhist monks and psychedelic users really experiencing the same phenomenon? Well, there appears to exist a spectrum of mystical experiences, some temporary glimpses and other permanent shifts. At one end of the spectrum are contractive experiences commonly related to Eastern meditative traditions of the most fundamental sense of being prior to sensory perception and thought processes, the peeling away of all transient impermanent facets of experience to reveal a base nature that remains unchanged. If your experience of life transcends the limitations of sense perception, suddenly everything is different. At the other end are expansive experiences regularly triggered by high doses of psychedelics, of infinite consciousness, unlimited loving intelligence so boundless yet connected, visceral, ineffable existential insight so profound yet familiar, it's simply incapable of being fully understood when the typical finite operations of the human mind resume. And just to have the identity of Tom get stripped away completely and get thrown into the center of existence was like, it was mind-boggling, man. Essentially, it appears that you can become nothing and you can become everything. But as one approaches the extremes of either polarity, 
these distinctions begin to diminish, for nothingness is also an element of everything. And if there's truly nothing, there are also no boundaries to hinder everything. At either extreme, the distinctions perceived by our standard mental operating system begin to unify, including the distinction between self and other, evoking the one transcendent unity we collectively share. Or at least, that's the claim. That which is shared equally by all things, by all people. You become nothing but an infinite singularity of everything, all of creation and its source. Gurus claim that this is a realization of your true nature. Who you are beyond the form, beyond the thoughts and the emotions. You as the consciousness is the self. The self beyond the mind and body that transcends the human perceptions of time and space and these fabricated distinctions or dualities, including life and death. If this awareness was there all the time in your life, death would be just change of clothes. Many terms attempt to describe this experience. Cosmic consciousness, otherwise known as mystical experience, otherwise known as moksha, nirvana, and that happens to people. It has happened as far back as we know. It happens all over the world and in all cultures. And although nuances can be made amongst the following expressions, the human integration of this experience is referred to as awakening, enlightenment, and God realization. But linguistic description is futile, for language is an instrument designed to differentiate the facets of reality, and differentiation is the antithesis of this transcendental unity that all religious stories futilely attempt to point to. And language has abstracted this message and segregated the world into competing ideologies so firmly identified with that most of you will find it very blasphemous when I say, I am God. But is it not more blasphemous to arrogantly declare yourself as separate from God? hypocritically implying a lack of omnipresence that religious ideologues claim God to have. But in fact, what is blasphemy is not to say, I am God. What is really blasphemous is to say, I am a person. If my being is separate from God's being, then God's being must be limited. See, God is only truly omnipresent if your current experience is God's experience. But you don't feel like God, do you? Well, maybe that's the point. Maybe, as God, you are the ultimate actor. God is a trickster by his very nature. And everybody is really God, is a mask of God, who is playing that he's you. God, as the best actor, has convinced himself completely that the act is real. God chose to veil itself from the knowledge of what it is, and it's this sort of game God plays to live in this world as a seeming other, to slowly remember and learn that all of this is one. But what if it's possible, with a change in your state of consciousness, to viscerally, experientially, quote unquote, remember that you are God? But you are God. You are God? Of course. You literally are the whole of God. See, as religion declines in the West due to increased rationality, it's imperative the idea of God be recontextualized. For the increasing collective disconnect from the divine is manifesting in harmful, unsatisfactory approaches to find meaning and purpose. Exemplified by the identification with superficial and material pursuits particularly prevalent in the bodybuilding world. So for those lacking that deeper connection with the universe, I offered a more rational perspective to the story of the man apparently crucified for his blasphemy 2,000 years ago. The man who called himself God, Jesus Christ. Jesus was actually teaching that we and God are one and the same, right? And then right. the Christian religion is really teaching the separateness that God is some all-powerful superior being and we are inferior. And it's all based on this huge misinterpretation of, of Jesus's teaching. Could Jesus have been a human? just like you or I, who was an exemplar for the highest integration of the mystical experiences available to all. Jesus of Nazareth was a human being, like Buddha, like Sri Ramakrishna, like Ramana Maharshi, who early in life had a colossal experience of what we call cosmic consciousness. Was he the only son of God, or a son of God, like us all, 
who was sufficiently free from the judgment of others to announce this realization. The real good news is not simply that Jesus of Nazareth was the Son of God, but that he was a powerful Son of God who came to open everybody's eyes to the fact that you are too. And could his teachings have been misinterpreted by those lacking direct experiential insight into cosmic consciousness? Those who conflate beliefs and faith with direct mystical experience. They misinterpreted Jesus because they weren't enlightened, so they only had the lens of ego to listen to him through. Did this lack of understanding lead to mistranslations that distorted the original meaning? It doesn't say that in your King James translation. It says, I am the Son of God. And you'll see the the italicized, and you will think that that is for emphasis if you don't realize that passages in italics in the King James Bible are interpolations by the translators. If we examine the scriptures more thoroughly, did Jesus ever attempt to pedestalize himself or connect us all under one divine unity? And he replied, isn't it written in your law, I have said you are gods? At John 17, I pray you all would be one with the Father just as he and I are one. I pray you would all realize this oneness. And have other God-realized gurus attempted to articulate this same ineffable message through different language? And this is why all of the, you know, Tibetan and Hindu gurus and, and masters who read Jesus go, oh yeah, he's an, he was an enlightened being, obviously, because they're, they're in that state themselves, so it's easy to recognize. Could the full integration of cosmic consciousness lead to the human potential for miracles? Well, maybe. Some believe so. I'm sure his 40-day fast was real. But for those more rationally minded, consider this. Maybe some miracles were metaphorical or magic tricks. Winery. Water into wine is into vinery. It's a metaphor sublime intoxicated. On life itself, it's not magic. He wasn't an elf. He's you and you're him. Blasphemy. I'm going out on a limb. It's blasphemy. Maybe some, like healing the sick, were due to placebo. Trust me, the placebo effect can be powerful. Or maybe Jesus was the world's greatest actor, and his death and resurrection was the greatest play of all time. According to the swoon hypothesis, this is the case, and Jesus faked his death. That's what Osho believes. Jesus never died on the cross. The Jewish cross takes at least 48 hours for a person to die. Jesus was taken down from the cross only after six hours. There is no possibility of his dying on the cross. It was a conspiracy. And there's actually considerable biblical evidence for this hypothesis. Pontius Pilate never checked if Jesus had died. And guess where Jesus went? Guess who Jesus was given to? Jesus was given to Joseph of Ar Arimathea, which yeah. was his friend, right? And took it taken to Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. And look, whether true or not, this perspective provides the empowerment that Christianity obstructs. For one can't aspire to emulate an idol with divine superiority. The humanization of Jesus resurrects a role model of acceptance, forgiveness, and mental freedom that's been lost to the rational world. So maybe the second coming of Jesus Christ is the collective realization of Christ consciousness, the resurrection of the Christ within you. So Christ consciousness is the awareness of my oneness with my creator. As Jesus said, I and the Father are one. Just in time to save the spiritually defeated bodybuilding world from an apocalyptic disaster. Now is the belief that one has the ability to attain the same mental achievements as Jesus a more rational perspective of religion? Or is this a delusion of grandeur commonly associated with cult leaders with narcissistic personality disorder? Well, <laughs> that's for you to know and for me to find out. What is a cult? See, the word cult is similar to the word drug in that its definition is almost entirely connotational. A cult is a social group that is defined by its unusual religious, spiritual, or philosophical beliefs and rituals. So to clarify, it's a social group with beliefs and practices different from those who classify it as a cult. It's completely subjective. So for those of you with different ideologies, you might think I'm starting a cult. Sounds like you're trying to start your own cult. I do say that I'm God. Because God literally encompasses everything, right? 
I'm I'm arguing that or I am God. Right. I certainly partake in esoteric rituals. I participate in large gatherings with like-minded individuals. Some might even see the analogy of ayahuasca and drinking the Kool-Aid. The resemblance is uncanny, but I see your bodybuilding community as a cult. You worship your own idols and refer to them as aesthetic gods. You have your own rituals, proven to be quite destructive, by the way. You periodically congregate with like-minded individuals. And while I take my Kool-Aid orally, you usually inject it into your ass. So maybe my cult-like behavior is intentional, a symbolic representation, the antithesis of the bodybuilding cult. One thrives off social anxieties, comparison to others, and superficiality. The other prospers through inner confidence, connection between others, and the deeper initiative of self-actualization. Now, of course, the ultimate goal is to let go of your attachment to all ideologies, to question the beliefs that are limiting your freedom. To practice open-mindedness and critical thinking, scrutinize all external information, including this, and program yourself to deprogram your societal conditioning so you have the ability to escape any cult, religious, political, or social. So ultimately, I don't want you to trust even me or latch on to anything I say. But in the meantime, I have provided you with the methodologies and mindsets to rehabilitate you from the toxic mindsets and behaviors that are fueling your social anxieties. Because so long as someone is identified with their thoughts, it's inevitable that absconding from one cult will lead them to seek a new identity in another, which is why anti-cults can be useful. Take Alcoholics Anonymous, for example, the epitome of anti-cults periodic gatherings, and a 12-step philosophy that involves a spiritual awakening, eerily analogous to Jesus' initial 12-apostle cult. But it's difficult to argue that this doesn't trump the alternative. So if my alternative perspectives help you let go of bodybuilding's harmful perspectives, should they be discouraged? Well, again, that's for you to know and for me to find out. But what I do know is that no cult drama is complete without a captivating origin story. May 8th, 2020, the bodybuilding world was shocked. Connor Murphy had posted multiple videos on YouTube, but something was off. I framed each video as an acting exercise. We are actors, we're acting, okay? Then appear to proclaim spiritual messages to my close friends and family. You can have actual faith, faith that doesn't come and go. Once someone fully understands it, they're a type of disciple. It would make me a god. Make a fucking god, Trusty! You're a fucking god! But the most disturbing behavior of all was that I was wearing a shirt. The next day, things escalated. I posted a video titled Goodbye, which was later deleted by YouTube. It began contextualizing the video as an act, but where on the acting spectrum did this performance fall? We've done this in the last few videos. This is just acting, okay? Then he starts acting, or does he? We don't know. There were certainly some who doubted its authenticity. Do I always cry with zero tears? Or is that an acting shortcoming of mine? Did I really fuck three girls a day? I fucked three fucking girls a day. Three girls a day. <laughs> Impressive. Or was the discord between my apparent state of despondency and my perceived aspirational lifestyle a metaphor for the lack of fulfillment in the superficial pursuits that the bodybuilding world is so attached to? I profess the discontentment with my family. He's talking about mental health, the struggles that he had with his parents. Was this sincere or was this the first clue of a formulated storyline analogous to the dysfunctional family of Connor Murphy, a character in the Broadway play Dear Evan Hansen who committed self-deletion. Connor, it took his own life. This fan theory is thoroughly discussed in Act 6 of this video. I declared this would take place in my bathtub. I realized why the bathtub feels so amazing because it's trying to tell me something. And thanked Netflix for the inspiration. Thank you <laughs> for teaching me it's possible. Was this my plan, or was this a symbolic critique 
of the romanticization of self-harm in the Netflix series 13 Reasons Why, where one of the main characters, Anna Baker, unalived herself in a bathtub. I'm gonna bake her and a baker and a baker and a baker. We're in this one together. I gave away my address. Was this a terrible idea, or was my lease ending so I simply never planned to return, and instead moved to Austin to complete my 40-day fast? Was what appeared on the surface the reality? So, a good story leaves certain elements up for audience interpretation. But this portion deserves a more explicit clarification, because an apology is necessary. A cowardice approach would be to blame my behavior on drug-induced psychosis, even though I had recently participated in my ayahuasca ceremony. And although that may have been a catalyst for my performance, it was my deliberate decision to fake my death. And those close to me are aware of this. When he was getting detained by authorities, he gave me a memory card from his camera. I did watch the footage. And when I watched the footage, it became clear to me that all of this was an act. Connor had no plans of hurting himself or anyone else. Although I never explicitly said I was going to unalive myself, I did purposely imply it, despite zero intention to do so. And there is certainly remorse I'd like to express, for there were some people close to me that were unnecessarily devastated by the possibility that I may have harmed myself. So if I were to endure the totality of this experience again, the most important alteration would be to let more people in on it from the start, especially my manager, Michael Trillstein. I am sincerely sorry, bro. Now, this was the beginning of the most controversial of characters. After the bellowing of incoherent spiritual ramblings, I sought inspiration from the swoon hypothesis discussed in chapter six. He did not die on the cross. He faked his death. To continue the play that emulated my number one role model. The role model most free from all insecurities, not just social anxieties, but the existential uncertainties that are the deepest sources of fear. So I faked my death, but that didn't conclude the performance for the day. I vlogged the rest of that day in a video titled The Day I Said Goodbye. First, I left behind a fake note, analogous to the note in Dear Evan Hansen, that was mistaken for a self-deletion note. Connor didn't write this. What does that mean? Connor didn't, he didn't write this. Then I drove 30 minutes to Venice Beach where I walked on water, quote unquote, healed the sick, and did some good deeds, like gave away my car. I made sure the police knew about the video to make sure I was arrested. Excuse me, sir, excuse me, sir. I, I watch YouTube video. I watch YouTube video. Connor Murphy say he and gave my location to a friend so he could pull a Judas and reveal my location to the authorities. Now, due to stories from certain women I've dated who underwent periods of mental instability, I was very familiar with the 5150 protocol, where if someone appears to be a danger to themselves, they'll be placed in a 72-hour, three-day psychiatric hold. The plan was to undergo the 72-hour hold in a place where medical confidentiality protected my location from being publicly known. I planned to be locked in a vault for three days and three nights and then resurrect. And they eventually find him and he goes into a mental institution and because he's like, he's proud of it. It's weird. He's like, this was all part of the plan and whatever. And at the time, I was proud. This ridiculous plan was going well, but I got too cocky and I completely deserved what was coming. See, I had implemented three safety nets to assure there was sufficient evidence that I was acting and not a legitimate threat to myself so I wouldn't be held longer than 72 hours. First, I contextualized the goodbye video as an acting reel at the beginning and at the end. Secondly, I intentionally never explicitly said I was going to unalive myself. Third, I told a few close people beforehand my plan. But unfortunately, they refused to watch the video. They refused to listen to the people I had call in. They went off the police report and their personal judgment of my thoughts and behaviors. And they rightfully so believed I was clinically insane and implemented a 5250, a 14 day hold 
and forced me to take medication. And looking back on it, I was clinically insane. It takes a mentally unstable type of manic grandiosity to attempt such a ridiculous feat. I certainly had bipolar tendencies and signs of psychosis. And I'm sure the doctors had my best interests in mind. Some people would claim that the psychiatric business model incentivizes doctors to hold patients involuntarily, overdiagnose disorders, and overprescribe medication for profit. I don't believe that nonsense for a second. Sure, I never stated I needed to unalive my physical self to prove I'm God. I was expressing a perspective of mysticism, that the path to God is through the death of the ego or the death of the psychological self. Killing myself, killing myself, killing my lower egoic self. But now I see the reason these delusions of grandeur are classified as a psychiatric disorder. They simply don't align with the extensive psychological scientific research, and I should have known better. Scientific experts will tell you that psychedelics simply induce hallucinations in the brain. And it's unrealistic to assume they could have provided some insight to a higher power. I have a newfound respect for people of authority, especially doctors. And now that I'm back to reality, <laughs> I realize I'm just some washed up, balding meathead that thought he was more intelligent than he really was. And the worst part of all is that I actually convinced people. It was like I had the magical ability to deceptively put my psychosis on pause. In the middle of my craziest videos, I spoke with a psychologist with an Eastern philosophical background. I justified my sporadic behavior. I want to make grandiose claims like I'm God. Ah! But then, oh, why did I do that? I, I'm feeling so depressed. You know, I, it's like even worth living anymore. <laughs> I did that to show you that I have complete control over my mood, I act exactly how I want to at any time, and convinced her it was all an act. Because I'm putting on this play for mental health awareness, but, and now I'm kind of revealing all of it. That I wasn't actually depressed, and I was actually having a great time. I've had a blast the whole time. The whole so time. So when does it end? Uh, soon. That I wasn't even taking ayahuasca. Uh, but like ayahuasca, um, and I've been, been pretending to microdose it, right, for the, the camera though. To the point where she recommended no medication whatsoever. Hunter, yeah, I'm not making any sorts of recommendations for medication. Yeah. Story is, yes, on the fringes, uh, but is it totally disorganized and not within the realm of uh, believing? No. And somehow she believed my story, and the saddest part about that was that I wasn't just deceiving her, but I was deceiving myself. I was in denial. I was coping. There's no rational excuse for giving away your banking info. So he has his fucking banking information, his PayPal, his crypto passwords. See, I tried to justify it beforehand. I, you know, I, I said it was a positive message to portray the unfulfilling nature of the attachment to material pursuits, but now I'm broke. He'd also mentioned in a recent video that he didn't have any money left. The moral of the story is that I'm broke. <laughs> it's tough to find the positive in such a destructive series of unfortunate events. <sighs> I just want to make the best out of what happened, to spread the most positive, beneficial message that I can rationally formulate. So that's what I'm about. To attempt to do like this you see oh. it's time to wake up question what we've been told consensus has been wrong new truths unfold i promise you the truth will set you motherfucking free but i'm in motherfucking psychosis don't listen to me again i want to be clear there is no doubt in my mind that i was clinically insane if anyone tells you that i ever claimed to not have been crazy simply untrue but again, I just want to take something positive from my psychotic episode. And if there's one thing it taught me, it's how to be free from social anxiety. And to not give a fuck about what other people think of you. And this is the focus of my social anxiety course's number one technique, ACE. The anti-conditioned expressiveness technique I described in Act 3. To film yourself acting outside of social norms. To eradicate your fear 
of the judgment of others. So I've demonstrated this method on my other channel, but I'd like to show you the other reason I invented it. So I shall perform for you my ACE method. Remember, it's just an acting exercise. I'm playing a character. I'll probably mention the pharmaceutical industry, but I need to be clear, I would never speak badly about the pharmaceutical industry, especially in a YouTube video, because disagreeing with medical authority is actually against the community guidelines. It can not just get this video demonetized, but completely taken down with a strike added to my channel. Guys, social media is not the place for free speech, and I completely support that. We shouldn't be putting out dangerous or misleading information that could negatively affect impressionable audiences. We need to just listen to the experts. They obviously know what they're talking about. But to satirize or parody misinformation is allowed. So that's what I'm about to do. It's satire. It's just an act. Everything from the moment you hear action to when the director yells cut, it's a performative exercise called ACE, Anti-Conditioned Expressiveness. So remember, guys, this is just acting, okay? Oh my god, he has finally set me free. Thank you, Lord. You're welcome. I miss you guys. Glad to be back. Now, first of all, Andrew Tate, here's where you fucked up, motherfucker. And I'm saying this out of love, my brother. You on my old Adonics podcast, I don't agree with everything you say, but I do empathize with you, my top G. It's quite obvious you had a plan to save this world, just like I do. This is stage oh. one of a three-step plan. So I'm gonna be viral for a little bit longer, then step two begins. The conquest is continuing. So I will, this is I, just I will the beginning. Own the world. I will like own a lot the world. of people. But to defeat the Matrix is no easy task. You should have said you were playing a fucking character when they asked you. Is this all just an act? No, this is the real me. It doesn't matter if you are or not, you see, if an idea is gonna resonate with someone, it's gonna fucking resonate with someone. It doesn't matter if you're playing a character. We're all playing characters, motherfucker. We're all filtered. You can't be yourself in the Matrix. They'll fucking destroy you. They hate the free speech that threatens their agendas. That's why you gotta say you're acting. Treat it as a performance, and you can have your free speech. It also promotes saying whatever the fuck you wanna say. See, comedy used to serve this purpose. Every human being on Earth had to pass through the legs of a woman to be on Earth. That is a fact. You sprinkle in truth, disguised as jokes. Now they're even canceling that. So we gotta straight up create characters. Or oh, say you're gay, that'll help too. No one dare cancel a gay man, they'd be homophobic. Say you're gay, just say you're gay. You get away with anything. Oh, and you might as also well identify as a female. Because you can identify as anything these days. The problem is I'm not sure which is more beneficial, saying I'm gay or saying I'm a female. It also helps if you're crazy. The main point is for big corporations not to take you seriously. They took you seriously. You came on too hard and too fast. A premature ejaculation of power. The Matrix doesn't like that. It takes a more sophisticated infiltration to save the world. A grand setup. A play. To grab the people's attention while remaining uncancelable. Trust me, I've tested it in many ways, and I'm still here. So let me tell you what needs to happen to break out of the matrix. It starts with a collective epiphany of authority bias, the foundation for control. See, they brainwash you into believing some label is objectively indicative of the value of their subjective ideologies. You blindly trust authority, PhDs and MDs, because they have an extra two letters and a fucking dot in the name. Yet doctors have been proven to be wrong throughout history. They used to promote goddamn cigarette smoking, for Christ's sakes. The father of communism, Karl Marx, acquired a fucking PhD. It means fucking goddamn nothing. Which is why I purchased an honorary doctorate to mock the absurdity of authority bias that plagues our world. That's right, legally I'm Dr. Connor Murphy. So now that I have the authority, listen to me as I dissect the corruption of Western society's most profitable code, the collusive pharmaceutical and psychiatric industry. See, they want you to believe you're mentally ill. They're incentivized to fabricate mental disorders out of thin air so they can overdiagnose and overprescribe addictive medication. 
for profit. They create the problems and then profit from the solutions at the expense of your goddamn soul. <laughs> I've got a chemical imbalance. Bitch, no shit, you've got a chemical imbalance. But it's the grandest display of naivety to believe an addictive pill is the only solution. You know it also alters your neurochemistry, exercise, your diet, sunlight. Did you know 90% of serotonin is produced in your gut? Nah, they don't tell you that. They'd rather you consume all sorts of processed garbage that destroys your gut biome and then fix you with medication. Oh, but that's just scratching the goddamn surface. There's nothing that doesn't change your chemical imbalance, your life situation, your negative thoughts, fucking breathing. I'm changing your goddamn neurochemistry right now, motherfucker. Maybe you're getting offended. Because it threatens your beliefs. Your adrenaline and cortisol are spiking, leading to increased serotonin uptake, depleting your brain of that happy hormone. Your victim mentality is your real sickness, don't you see? Or if you're a confident top G, dopamine is flooding your brain, causing you to feel motivated by this rant, you realize you have the power to control your own mind. You don't need to be a slave. Just like bodybuilding covers up your insecurities with an egotistical attachment to your body, these pills just hide the root cause of your anxiety and depression. That is your toxic mentalities and your unhealthy, unfulfilling lifestyles. But now, by design, you're hooked on those pills. You're not cured, you're worse off than before. Because as soon as you stop taking them, you'll be hit with excruciating withdrawal symptoms. Just like exogenous testosterone suppresses your natural testosterone production, making your ball shrink. These artificial chemicals suppress your natural neurotransmitter production, makes your brain shrink. And if you're on antipsychotics, I do mean that literally. But it gets worse. They're fucking hiding the research from you. Sounds like the wildest is conspiracy theories, right? But no, it's 100% fucking true. The scientific journals cherry pick the positive antidepressant trials. Positive findings are around twice as likely to be published as negative findings. This is a cancer at the core of evidence-based medicine. And they're all unimpressive, barely better than placebo, but they want you to believe that they work 94% of the time, when in reality, it's a goddamn corn toss. And that's just when you're on them. It doesn't include the hell you burn in when you come off. But you uncritically trust the science as if science is a flawless, unbiased system when it's quite evident psychologists don't know jack shit about the mind. Fewer than half of psychological studies can ever be replicated. You see, I just appeal to science to provide studies because you worship science as your goddamn fucking god. But the delusion that the medical and scientific authorities possess objective knowledge of subjective mental phenomenon is an epistemological calamity. But we give them the power to profit by holding people involuntarily in a psychiatric prison for simply thinking differently. In India, you can exclaim your God and they're ecstatic for you to finally realize it. But you say your God in America, they lock you in a goddamn psych ward. What in the hell kind of modern day slavery, religious discrimination bullshit is even that? It's the biggest fucking morally degenerate scam of Western society. And the worst part is, they fucked up my goddamn otherwise immaculate play. Held me 14 days instead of three days, three nights. Guess it's karma for not letting my manager Shrillstein in on the fake death thing. But that didn't stop me. I found another psych ward to symbolize that missing puzzle piece. Had to act a little eccentric, kind of like this. <laughs> and sure enough, I was in. Aw, oh, shucks. <sighs> Dang. Got in the psych ward again. Shoot. And after a nice weekend vacation, I resurrected after exactly three days. No medication taken, no medication prescribed. You're not the first person to do this, right? There have been like historically like investigative reporters that have done yeah, uh, things yeah. like we have been to psychiatric hospitals. See, we must embody abnormality for normality is the real mental disorder. That's why I went back, what, uh, 16 times after that? 18th time in the fucking psych ward. It's all a fucking act! Is that good? But to this day, I haven't taken another bullshit pharmaceutical that you worship. If only there was 
some miracle motherfucking substances that change your brain chemistry positively and consistently, reducing anxiety, depression, PTSD, social anxiety, virtually every mental shortcoming imaginable, but somehow cures addictions rather than causes them that are extremely physiologically safe, that produce an afterglow effect, leaves you better off than before even when you stop. Oh wait, oh wait, oh wait, let's really fantasize for a moment. What if high doses of these substances somehow induce religious and mystical experiences? A connection with cosmic consciousness, the universe, or God, it doesn't matter what the fuck you want to call it, but it instills meaning and purpose back in your unfulfilling lives. Oh fucking wait! Growing research suggests psychedelics could be a breakthrough cure for some mental health disorders. The research suggests psilocybin reduces the brain's response to negative emotional stimuli. With psilocybin treatment, we were seeing immediate reductions in depression symptoms, immediate relief that lasts for months without side effects. May be able to replace daily medications for months or years on end without therapy. Hallucinogens to treat anxiety, depression, and addiction. More than 80% who were given the psychedelic treatment drastically reduced their drinking. Showing far more connectivity in the brain after treatment. The people that they dosed with psilocybin, about 75% of them had a mystical experience, which they regarded as one of the most important experiences of their life. That's what ayahuasca did for me. I really feel like that experience paved the way for me to have uh, the best season of my career. See, throughout this video, I provided you the code. Legal ceremonies involving the most powerful of psychedelics. Ingredients completely legal to purchase online, plus a recontextualization of religion and a conceptual framework for mystical experiences. Do you see the point yet? Do you understand that you've been indoctrinated with preconceived beliefs responsible for your mental slavery? The ego is the most sophisticated program, an intricate psychological algorithm, creating and protecting an illusory identity responsible for your suffering. And the robust mechanisms that defend the ego's survival inoculate it from the enlightening rhetoric that threatens it. So to effectively and collectively eradicate the ego, you must appeal to the ego through the superficial drama it's attracted to and gradually shrink it with progressively more expansive ideas. And that's what this play is truly designed for. Let me put it simply. Boris the bodybuilder insecure. Boris likes seeing others fail. But Boris no listen to meditation and social anxiety bullshit. So Boris must be tricked by show to learn better ideas. And holy fuck, you were tricked. Bitch, you think I gave away all my bank info and passwords? The fuck? Let me get this straight. You think this shit is fucking real? But you think I can't type some goddamn fake passwords? I gave away all my passwords? Okay, why are my social media accounts hacked? Use your goddamn mind. I did a way better job at faking revealing my bank login info in the video I just posted. Now that was a work of art. But see, now you're sucked in by this negative drama. It's quite simple. Do crazy shit. More place, more dates makes literally dozens, dozens of videos about you. Now people are invested in drama. And some of them start questioning things. I guarantee you, more plays, more dates is the reason. Thousands of guys finally tried the divine protein shake. You don't think they're doing it? Oh, they're doing it. Trust me. And why fucking not? Not one study, not one single fucking study doesn't show positive effects. You worship science and then say to hell with it when your societal conditioning makes your stomach feel a little queasy, yeah? You wanna know the real reason I love it? Cause Jesus did it. Too bad that ancient text didn't make it into the Bible. It is the ultimate sacrament. And you know what has been called the goal of the blood? The elixir of a long life? That's right, urine is an ancient fucking Easter medicine with only, only positive scientific research. Cow urine reduces cancer symptoms. Not one shred of evidence against it, you hypocritical fuck. Also, every single goddamn study shows when you don't let animals eat their own shit, copra phagia, they call it, it fucks them up physically and mentally. See, it's all about nourishing the beneficial gut bacteria that produce 90% of your serotonin. 
No wonder they want you to think it's gross. They can't profit off that. They need your gut destroyed so they can get you addicted to SSRIs. See, they're saved by your arrogance. Thinking you're superior to your almost biologically equivalent relatives that do do it. Don't you see how I'm exposing the blatant hypocrisy for having a bromance with science when it confirms your beliefs, but saying fuck you when it threatens your beliefs? That is what is truly fucking disgusting. Wake the fuck up, fucking sheep. Bleh. You're the sheep, but I'm the goat. You think I'm fucking crazy? Hell fucking yeah, I am. Don't you believe for a second that all this was an act? Oh gosh, this is all acting. It's just an act. This is the realest fucking thing you've ever seen. This is the embodiment of true freedom. Free from insecurity. Free from social anxiety. This is what a spiritual fucking awakening really looks like. The Murphians shall rise, and I'm here to wake up the world. Woo! Jeez, that was uh, quite the crazy character. Good thing I, I don't believe any of that stuff. Again, it's simply a powerful technique to overcome social anxiety. Social anxiety. February 21st, 2022. After a long-awaited return, the original Connor Murphy persona was commenced and has continued to present day. You've got a cock in here. For to make the impact I desire, I must appeal to the audience most in need of this message of self-actualization, universal connectedness, and freedom from social anxieties. But the return was initiated far before anyone realized. On the left is me right after the 40 day fast. And on the right is me exactly three months after the fast. 55 pounds later, the world's most dramatic two year adult bodybuilding transformation was complete. To earn back the respect of the bodybuilding community required to successfully express these deeper perspectives. And the most unnatural substance I took for assistance. I will send you a full fucking cycle of turkesterone that is right, turkesterone. A natural plant steroid. Yet I'm 10 pounds heavier than my prime. And when compared honestly to former content under similar circumstances, my new physique rivals my prime. So as you know, I'm broke. He'd also mentioned in a recent video that he didn't have any money left. The moral of the story is that I'm broke. So I can only afford to wager $50,000 to any prominent bodybuilding YouTubers, I have a couple in mind that would want to bet that I'm taking anabolic androgenic steroids and I'll take multiple third-party randomized tests. Now, do I care whether I'm perceived as natural or unnatural? Fuck no, I don't give a flying fuck, but the bodybuilding world is in need of a mind fuck to ejaculate the open-mindedness required for mental transformation. And the complete transformation of the Connor Murphy narrative is the ultimate mindfuck material. But natty or not, Connor Murphy is back. This revitalized, superficial character exhibits an apparent reborn sanity, necessary to be taken seriously from the perspective of bodybuilders. Because ripping off my shirt for the validation of women is obviously the least crazy thing I've ever done. But in reality, this character is, of course, just an act. A persona redesigned with the utility of appealing to bodybuilding values. A reclamation of the authority required for maximal influence. For there is no one who can better motivate and escape from the bodybuilding cult than he who is perceived to be in it as well. So that's all I've got. I wish my agent, Archie Archambo, was still here so we could have made a more intriguing production, but I did my best. I'll ask just one thing of you. Please. Do not spread any rumors that any of this was just an act. Because that would take away from the incredible story of the tragic downfall of a popular influencer 
whose unfulfilling lifestyle turned into a ticking time bomb that exploded into an internet mockery that the world has never seen before. For to come back and show my face after the utter destruction of my reputation, and somehow make the best out of such a terrible situation by taking the empowering mindsets I learned to help others would be the most profound and inspiring social anxiety challenge that has ever existed. The greatest transmitter of mental health awareness. And it would sure make a great movie.